day during Kwanzaa, ceremonially, we light a new candle. You know, we start off with we start off with um, you know, the the unity candle in the middle. You know, for uh, Umoja. You know, we move out to the to the um, red Kujichigalia, and so and so on and so forth. You know, until the whole canar is lit lit up. You know, when you have your house, you know, dark, it's 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 actually a beautiful sight. You know, to do with your family there. Um, speaking of families, I also have here, you know, representing the harvest, I have a basket. I actually have, um, you know, African cloth that's actually from Tanzania and uh, in the basket representing the heart, both the harvest and the children in our house. You know, we just have some fruit here. You know, you can use fruit. You know, some people use corn, but just representing the first harvest. You know, um, I actually have two apples here, you know, representing our girls here and, you know, orange representing, you know, our little boy, TJ. So, um, yeah, so uh, what I like to do is just get into the ceremony. So we do it like this every day. Habari Ghani. Yes, today is the sixth day of Kwanzaa. So today's answer would be Kaumba, which is creativity. We are some of the most creative folks on the planet Earth. You name it, we invented it. So today is the day that we flex and we represent our black, beautiful, melanated, creative selves. So we do that by, you know, lighting the sixth, sixth um, candle. You know, so we have, you know, Ujima, we have Kujichu Galia, we have uh, Ujima, Ujama, and we have um, Nia from yesterday. So for today, we're lighting Kaumba. You can say it with me. Kaumba. Arambe. And remember, may these principles carry through not just through this Kwanzaa season, but through all the year. We keep them and we hold them dear to our hearts. Peace. Hello everybody, what it do? How you doing? How's it going? How's everybody feeling on this sixth day of Kwanzaa? Uh, my name is Christopher Eclipse and I am going to be bringing up a few things that I'm working on, some collectives that um, I'm in the process of working on basically. Um, today is about creativity and honestly, I'm happy that I got to do this day because it's probably the, <laughs> the only thing I know how to do is be creative. And uh, that's what my whole life has been. So without further ado, um, my collective is called Life Without Borders. And what that is, is a website. Under that website, it houses a few different things. Um, one of the things it houses is called HOME. And that stands for Home of Magnificent Enrichment. Home of Magnificent Enrichment. That was hard to get out this time. Say it with me, home of magnificent enrichment. What that is, is an exchange program that I've been working on um, that was inspired by a trip to the continent that I took um, that was um, really eye-opening for me. Um, I realized that at the age of 40 that I hadn't really lived yet and that I was getting a lot of healing from being on the continent and probably not in the way that people think like this big esoteric like ah uh, you know some spirit came to me and talked to me no it wasn't that actually um there was something really simplistic about uh simplistic healing that happened around feeling like a majority feeling like i was a human feeling important um is something that i wanted to um create it's an experience I want to give for other people, uh, young and old. And while I was there, I was um, working in the creative arts. So I was teaching uh, dance at a um, competition dance school. And I was doing, um, I was starting my program there called, this program called Home. And it was through creative arts. And that gave me um, the incentive to work through creative arts. Um, so basically how the program 
works is um, it's a birthright program where students, or not students, or people, um, 18 and under for now, but I would like to go up to the age of 30 eventually, uh, can go to the continent and work on a process for a uh, creative process for 10 days. And at the end of the 10 days is a culminating event where they can share their process. It's housed inside of an actual home uh, with different rooms in it. And each room has a different discipline. Go to that more in a second. The second program under Life Without Borders um, will be called Black Unicorns. Black Unicorn is a um, online series that was created um, for queer um, Black people around the world who are inspirational, who are doing work in outside, inside of our community and breaking down um, ceilings that seem to be in place for us. Um, not ceilings, I would say breaking down walls that are in place for us to be successful and to thrive. Um, Black Unicorns is a place um, where a younger me would have went to and watched and been able to see myself and some of the people that have come on the show. Um, at this point, um, the show is gonna be launched on an Instagram page, but it's also gonna be either Patreon or fan base, I haven't decided yet, but you will see a clip of a couple of the interviews um, there. Um, so without further ado, that's just a little bit of what we're gonna be talking about. There's some more surprises in place, but buckle up, let's get creative. Here we go. Home. All right, guys, welcome home. Um, again, this is um, gonna take you through a little bit of what home is about, how it started, why I think it's important, and um, hopefully um, people who are able, who are watching this will um, be inspired to join in as I build this, this path for us. All right, so home, let's go right into it. All right, all right. So this was inspired um, by a conversation I had a while back with some friends, it was years ago, actually five or six years ago, and they were talking about the birthright program, uh, the Israel birthright program, which I didn't really know much about. But at the time they were like, you know, there's a free program where um, Jewish people can go back for free. And I'm like, well, why? And they're saying because, you know, of the emotional pain they went through with Holocaust and, and, and how hard it was. And I was like, what? So they have a birthright program that they go back for free? And that put a seed in my head. I was like, well, if they've been through so much and they have a free birthright program, how come there's not one in place for African-Americans or black people in the diaspora, not just African-Americans at the time, I was only thinking about you know us, but that was, I was young at the time. But then I, honestly, everywhere we've been dropped off at around the world, why isn't there a birth by program to bring us back. So I started with this first slide. Um, over nearly two decades, a non-for-profit organization called Birthright Israel has given nearly 700 young Jews an ex all expense paid trip to Israel, an effort to bolster a distinct Jewish identity and forge an emotional connection to Israel. These trips, which are part funded by the Israel government have become a rite of passage for American Jews and Canadian Jews and other Jews, not just, not just American. Nearly 33,000 are set to travel this summer. And that's the New York Times 2021. Now, I'm not sure if they got 33,000 last summer or not because of COVID or not, but still the fact that 33,000 people um, were able to sign up and get over there. And like you said, 700,000 people have been helped, uh, have been able to go there and have that connection. It's just incredible already, I mean. Let's get into this a little bit more. All right, so you know, I put this, I put this slide in here. Sorry, I'm jumping ahead, because as as you said, as the slide before said that you know, there's like this emotional connection that they're trying to have, right, this, to Israel and to force your identity and whatnot. And I put this slide in because I think it's important that one we recognize as black people around the diaspora that not 
all people from the continent understand that we've been taken away from the continent. Um, one thing that I found really interesting while I was living in South Africa was that I had multiple conversations about um, why I didn't understand what tribe I was from. And I had to explain um, what slavery was. And it didn't make sense to me at first. Like, how do you not know about slavery? And how many times I had to talk to my brothers about, I don't know what tribe I'm from or what mother tongue I'm from. So the, the trauma is not just with us in America or Canada or Jamaica or Haiti or wherever you have or been dropped off, but also our brothers and sisters on the continent don't quite understand the millions and millions of us that have been taken away from there and never returned back, not unless we were lucky enough to encounter someone to inspire us to go back to Ghana or we have that pool to go back. And like, I'm sure you can watch people on this, on this Kwanzaa program that, that have went back um, and you know they've they've set up in different places, but that that comes with a certain amount of um, you know information. And some of us never have that information. And some of our brothers and, and sisters in Africa don't don't know about the millions of us that was um, bought from um, Africa to different parts of the um, Americas. So I put that in there because it's trauma for both of us, and it's something that we in the diaspora should be willing to have conversations about with our family around the world. But, you know, they say between 15 and 20 million of us is dropped off in, in this ocean. <laughs> um, I, I think it's a lot more, but um, this, this graph kind of explains, for those who don't know what the slave trade is, this graph kind of explains it. And um, you can go back and look at it. Um, in terms of identity, this uh, picture is like something that I identify with so much and that I realize even more is more, it means more to me now that I've lived in Africa. When I went to Africa, um, the healing that happened for me um, was realizing I was human. I had no idea that I did not I wasn't human, that I wasn't living a human existence. Um, being the majority in Africa was uh, empowering. And I, and I understood even how some of our, our white people in the world, other cultures, um, feel entitled the way that they do because when I was living there, I felt at home and I felt a right to be there and a right. I didn't feel a right to be racist or to hate anybody else for being there, but I definitely felt empowered. In this picture, um, this is in a picture of what W.E.B. Du Bois calls the double spirit, um, double-minded, double consciousness. And um, it's, it's pretty self-explainable. And I think that most black people are, um, who have been um, affected by slavery have uh, somewhat of this. And it's basically this big white man um, feeding information to this man. Um, and as you can see, he looks just like him. He's even wearing the Aryan Nation thing, uh, uh, symbol on his chest. And I, I think we, I know I definitely experienced that growing up. Um, I, you know, the identity crisis uh, where I would feel like there was another thing operating inside of me that was in conflict with what I was learning in school or how I was learning in school. Um, and when this man looks in the mirror, you can see um, the reflection look, looking back at him. I think of it of like his soul or his ancestors looking back at him. Um, and how do we, how do we connect with that, that spirit without going to the source. I mean, this is why a birthright program like this is so important because we will be learning um, through our own traditions. We'll be using our own creativity, our own voices, and it won't be uh, influenced by colonization. And, and that's just down the board, you know, um, through, well, I won't even go into that, but it won't be influenced by that. It will, it will be a program that 
um, allows us to express ourselves, how we express ourselves through our music, through our dance, through our thoughts, you know? All right. So this is, um, sorry, I'm skipping ahead a little bit. I didn't mean to do that. It's a peculiar sensation, this double consciousness, the sense of always looking at oneself through the eyes of others, of measuring one's soul by the tape of the world that looks on in amused contempt and pity. W.E.B. Du Bois. It is a peculiar sensation. We've all been there. We don't know what it is that we're feeling. We don't know why we feel out of place. Sometimes we're the only person that looks like us inside the room and we have to uh, fill our way out and, and, and code switch and do all these different things. And um, without having the groundedness of uh, understanding the land and the spirituality and the foundation of who we are, um, people are able to see that because for example, right now I, I live in Tokyo and it's a monoculture. It's mostly all Japanese people. Their heritage is ingrained in every single piece of their life. Their culture is in every single piece, how they go to the store, how they wake up in the morning, how they go to relax, how they go to work. And it is actually something really beautiful about that, that knowing. And I think that knowing is a right that everybody should have, everybody, specifically us, because it's been stripped away from us for so long, all right? So that's what this is talking about. And people can look on and see that we're confused. People can, can see how, how our culture has been divided. And I do feel like they look in contempt and pity at us at times, because there's something they're not experiencing, and again, this is again why we have to go back and get that foundation and that healing to the continent. So here's a little um, slide. 13.4% of the US population identifies as black or African-American. Over though, of those, over 16% reported having a mental illness in the past year. That doesn't sound like a lot, but that is over 7 million people. More people than the populations of Chicago, Houston, and Philadelphia combined. I, I, I personally think that the mental illness that we are facing in this country, in countries that have been colonized as Black people, is because we don't have a connection to our ancestors, that we don't have a connection to our land. Um, it is spawning from that double consciousness that never becomes singular, never becomes one voice. Um, and that is gonna always cause some mental illness in us until we find something to something do to, to help cure that. Okay, let's talk a little bit more about the, the tag light program, the Israel, the birthright program. Um, what are some of the benefits? And they, they say them very clearly in their websites. All right. All right, so, sorry, I gotta log out of this. My voice is recorded on there. I was gonna use a voice recording, but I decided not to, because I thought I should just talk like this. All right, anyway, let's just read a few of these. Um, the Tag Light Birthright Israel provides the gift of the first time peer group education, educational trips to Israel for. Jewish young adults, 18 to 26. The founders created this program to send thousands of young Jewish adults all over the world to Israel as a gift in order to diminish the growing division between Israel and the Jewish communities around the world, to strengthen the sense of solidarity among world Jewish, and to strengthen, to strengthen participants' personal Jewish identity and connection to the Jewish people. This program based upon a partnership among international philanthropists, Jewish federations in North America, um, Karen Hyswad, I hope I said that right, and the government of Israel, okay? Um, 
Let's just start there. All right. So the idea that this is creating a sense of solidarity amongst the world Jews is something that stood out to me. I think that our network, for example, this program is giving us a, a sense of solidarity from a worldly perspective. But imagine if everyone had the experience that I have and so many others of us have had going back to the continent and understanding who we are and being able to connect networks and businesses and growing our kids up um, with the understanding that they're human. Um, the solidarity that we will have in the market and the money that we could create for our community. Um, that just really stood out to me. Um, and also like the idea and to strengthen participants' personal Jewish identity. African people around the world, some of us don't even know or acknowledge our African ancestors, our identity. And that's, that is so scary. I know, you know, some of us are, are, we grew up in America, some of us grew up in Jamaica and that identity, is, or that identity is super strong, but we are the only culture in this world that disconnects from our home culture, from our home, our ancestral roots. And that disconnect is what's causing, again, the mental illness. It's important that we understand, even if you don't live on the continent, um, that that's a part of our identity. And that program is bringing that together for them. And I think that's something that we need. That's a little bit further. All right. Again, this is just talking about how um, the program works. Um, it's two programs. Uh, this is important. The students in this program can intern at one of Israel's 700 top companies in a variety of industries, variety. So this program is not only getting them there, giving them a sense of identity, it's putting them to work. They're actually working in these different countries and they have the option whether or not they want to live in Israel after the trip. And that's something that I would like to see home for home too. That when people go to visit, if they feel like they don't wanna come back, I feel like within our community, there's enough philanthropists, there's enough billionaires that can help us build this idea that, hey, if we actually feel more comfortable in the continent, let's invest in businesses there and let's set up us who want to go and stay. Let's be there. I hope this is making sense, guys. I get excited about this. So um, there are generally around 30 non-Israeli Jews per group who are at some point joined by a smaller group of activity duty Israeli soldiers under the stewardship of trip leaders who are usually the same age as the participants, which I think is really, really important, and a tour guide. The group visits to various places throughout the country, including holy sites, Udon tents, the, Hol the Holocaust Museum, random cool little towns, the Dead Sea and others, the lodgings range from high-rise hotels to Jewish farming co-ops known as kibbutzim. I hope I said that right. I'm not trying to be disrespectful to, their, to, to you know, any of your names if any Jewish people see this. <laughs> um, again, you can see the parallel. I don't think I have to make it um, here, but uh, one, these people are traveling to Israel with their peers. So they're having this conversation uh, with people that talk and look like them, whether they're 25, 30, 50, or, you know, whatever it is, the age, it's their peers. Um, and they're visiting really important places and being able to identify with those places. And we all know in Ghana, Sierra Leone, Brazil, Haiti, there's these places that we can go. And just from visiting, create an emotional response to us and responsibility to do the work. And it's a shame that some of us die without ever experiencing that and knowing the fullness of who we are. All right, I just, I just picked this picture because I had 
experiences like this when I was in the continent. Um, but this group of kids, um, I didn't put the, the caption here, but these guys have been on this trip together. They, some of, most of them did not know each other at the beginning of the trip. And now I just liked to see how the, the bonding is happening, how the closeness is happening. And I imagine with home, we're gonna have these same type of connections. And even though it looks like they're just chilling, maybe having a few drinks, these are lifelong connections. This is really important connections. This is giving them uh, friends and networking um, opportunities around the world. They'll go back and they'll never forget this experience and always will mostly have these people in their life. All right, let's see what he was talking about here. Just from these clips, you can see how amazing it is this trip changes people's lives, brings people together, gives people a sense of identity, creates culture in places that maybe there was no Jewish culture, connects opportunities for the future. And what is it that's so important about the future? Well, the future is the future. Future kids, future families, future babies, future banks, lawyers, doctors, nurses. And how do we create a society that works together? Well, we, we show them who they are. And it creates a bond. And it empowers them to go out to the rest of the world and share that information, that love with everyone else because they have a solid foundation. This is why the birthright program is so important not only to Jewish people, but to people around the world, to any marginalized culture. <laughs> so, you know, I wholeheartedly believe that it's time for us to take this seriously. I think it's time for us to get our kids back to the continent before they turn 18. And I do feel like for our elders who've never been, there needs to be something in place for them too. But for now, we're gonna concentrate on the kids um, and getting them back home with this birthright program. So what home is, again, it's a, it's a um, program where people can go and experience um, the continent uh, through creative, creative means. When I was in South Africa, I started to implement the program and what was really cool about the program is uh, we had people from the States and we had people from uh, South Africa working together. Um, there were musical performances um, once a week and it created this really beautiful synergy where we were able to um, make music, make songs, uh, perform together and I realized, yeah, this needs to happen for more people. Um, while I was there, I was um, able to uh, start working on a photography project and um, I had all the support I, that I needed to do that. So these are just some pictures that I took. And the reason I took these pictures was because, not because they're just beautiful pictures and, and everything, but I love to see the life that we live and that, that, is, um, that we have an opportunity to, to do um, in these places. The freedom and expression on these kids' faces was really beautiful. And it was just like the free, I, 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 I saw these black kids and I was just like, wow, you know, this is home and they don't feel the oppressor on them the same way that we do in the States, it was just something beautiful about seeing them playing in the park and feeling at home. So, so this is just another picture of uh, one of my friend's homes in South Africa. Um, uh, South Africa is very diverse, as we know, like most people know, um, there's a very diverse culture there. But the, again, I was just um, captivated by you know, the black kids and the, the, color, the colored kids and, and their freedom and their state of mind. Uh, and I wanted to show that diversity in South Africa, but uh, it really 
was eye-opening. And it was a bit shocking, to be honest, at first. I didn't know that that, I didn't know that um, Africa looked like that. And um, I also realized that a lot of us really don't know about apartheid the same way they don't know about slavery and how important it is that we, um, we do go to these places to learn about them, go to the place and, and experience it. Um, so again, that's what this picture was about. Um, I started connecting with my brothers out there and this is my first job. Um, and I am working as a, a stylist for an actor that uh, came to America, uh, came from Los Angeles, but works in South Africa. And he was doing a photo shoot. So I came on as a stylist and pulled clothes and um, the director, my brother, uh, Ayanda Sidibe, he's there with the light and Malou um, is in front of the light. Um, but I work with them and I start working on their team. And this is an example of just being on the continent, what kind of opened up for me. I was there for maybe two weeks and I already started to work within the community. Um, not, really, not only was I working in the community, but I was making these networks that lasted me my whole time there. I ended up working as a teacher at the uh, Johannesburg Opera um, through Allende, who is the one holding the light there. That's my brother. And that job sustained me and I was able to pay my bills and I was able to meet um, opera singers and I was able to do all this amazing stuff um, just by being there and saying, hey, my name is Eclipse. I would love to do this and here's the opportunity. And I just love the way that those doors are opening. And I wanted to put this picture in to show again, um, how, how possible it is and why these programs are important and why we, why we do need to be working together creatively um, because it opened up some real serious doors for me and also them. Speaking of, so while I was there, uh, I told you I was, uh, I was, I was um, teaching at a dance school and um, I worked in several dance schools out there. And this is, this is the moment um, that I wanna show how, it imp how important it is not only for us to go to the continent and share our creative experiences, but how, the, how being there will open up opportunities for everybody, uh, well not everybody, for people that live there on the continent. So these are my brothers, uh, all from South Africa. When I was there, I met this young man, Monty, uh, at a school that I was teaching at. And through that school, um, I met a woman named Julie, uh, who, who owns the dance school. Um, once I left South Africa, I was propositioned with a job at Universal Studios to help develop a show and choreograph a show for Universal Studios. I ended up working as a dancer and casting, basically. Um, the show happened to be about um, Afrobeat and it was, it was a Sesame Street show. Um, this is a year later after I've moved away from Africa. But I realized this was an opportunity for me to bring some of the people that I met there to Tokyo and give them an uh, opportunity to work on an international level, whatnot. And if I had never been to the continent and lived there, that opportunity that came to me in the States, I would have never been able to share that with them. Now, once they got I was able to hire them and they were they came to the continent. Two of them actually decided, I mean, they came to Tokyo. Two of them actually decided to stay in Tokyo and to live because it was a dream of theirs. And they're now setting up their life in Tokyo. And that again is how we can do this cross networking thing with these programs. Um, because now they're getting opportunities that they give back to me. I'm getting opportunities around the world that when I can, I can give to them. Uh, this is Stanza, by the way. Stanza choreographed uh, day one of the Kwanzaa celebration. If you haven't seen it, go check it out. He killed it. But again, that was, um, 
a chance opportunity for us because I love working with their brother. He's always professional. Um, and I was able to call him and say, hey, Stanza, are you, can you do this uh, choreography for you know, this Kwanzaa program? And he said, yeah, and he did it. And, and now you guys are able to watch it. But all of this is because you know, the opportunity that I had to be on the continent and, and work with my brothers. And then we all had an opportunity to work together in Tokyo together. And then now that opened up more networks for all of us. And so um, because of that, it's just creating this space of opportunity. And I think we can do that over and over and over again if we just keep this momentum going and keep these type of programs going on. Uh, I put this here to show, this is all my brothers, um, Los Angeles, South Africa, uh, Ohio, uh, Philadelphia, um, all working together in Japan because of the opportunity that I had in the continent. And I, yeah, anyway, I think that's, I think they're going to create more, more doors. Again, this is just uh, being in South Africa, just living day by day, um, finding my healing, meeting family. Um, there was a home that opened up to me and we would literally just be able to, you know, have picnics in the yard and um, it was just a beautiful space. And this is just all about how being there had healed me, healed me basically. All right, so, um, you know, you can see the correlation between what, you know, the tag light program, the tag light program did for its people and what just me going to South Africa end up living there did for me. This is the experience. Again, I want to make this experience for, I want to make this experience for 700,000 young black people around the world. So that's what the goal is with home, right? Uh, here it, it says, it started as a bold idea, bring young Jews to Israel free of charge for a life-changing, immersive look at our homeland. Today, Taglet Birthright Israel, a partnership of the Jewish Agency for Israel, is the world's, ed, the, world, the largest educational tourism program in the world. And I'll start with a, with, with a vision, you know. Um, it's funded through a combination of sources, the Israeli government, local Jewish community centers around the world, rich Jewish philanthropists, so some of y'all need to come off the money so I can get this done. And um, their community is just taking care of it. So this is why I think, although I know this is a big vision, I know that we have the resources in our community to do this properly. And I've already did it this way. So anyway, this is just some of the work cited. Uh, you can go to those if you wanna read more about it. And I did go to um, an organization called the Birthright or Africa Organization that is a birthright program for us. And I love what the work they're doing. Um, they're doing they're doing the work and my program is gonna be more centered around creative um, arts, um, as I said before. But um, I shared all this to say is that this is almost like a pitch. Um, I am looking forward to um, moving this program forward, getting proper funding, and I also need help. So if you are out there looking at this and any of this sounds like something that you wanna be involved with, contact a brother. Um, I do need help with this. Um, and I know, that it is, I know that it is coming to fruition. I know that it is gonna happen. I know that we have the resources. I know that this is my purpose. And I think that in terms of creativity, what could be more powerful than seeing the work that, you know, our brothers and sisters from the continent do in other places, like my brothers are doing in Japan right now, um, and, and our brothers and our young kids from the States, seeing them in the continent thriving, like I was able to thrive, you know? So if this vibrates with you in any way, come on board and help brother. All right, thank you guys. Um, now time for the Black Unicorn series. All right, so the next part of this uh, program that I'm gonna talk about is called the Black Unicorn Series. It's another creative venture that is going under the Life Without Borders um, website. And it is a series that is meant to inspire uh, 
young and old uh, black queer people. Um, I think it's important that we see um, people like ourselves thriving. So I'm gonna read uh, what the black unicorn is and what I wrote it is. And um, then I'm gonna show you a few interviews of the black unicorn uh, series. And if you wanna check out the black Uni unicorn series or even are interested in being interviewed, uh, I'll leave the information for you to do that. But this is what a black unicorn is. A black unicorn is someone who has magically created a path of their own. By magic, I don't mean it wasn't hard work. I mean, it's the hard work that was the magic. Someone who defies societal norms in some form of another and actively works to spread love to a greater community through their works. Black unis are not afraid of fear. They welcome change and liberate people rather consciously or unconsciously. Black unicorns are lovers. They above all love themselves so much that they have a well of love to give to others. So with the Black Unicorn series, uh, I ask them questions and I just take out, extract the gems. And this is another, like I said, this is gonna feature on Life Without Borders website. And it will be on the Instagram page as well. Um, well, there'll be many interviews on the, um, on the um, Instagram page, but I'm gonna show you guys a few clips of some Black Unicorns I was fortunate enough to um, to interview and then we'll come back. You already, which is why I asked you to be a part of it. You already have your own mm -hmm. platform. You're already doing your thing. You're already inspiring people in so many different ways. Um, Thank you. You really are. I'll be reading your stuff. I'll be like, give it to them raw and just- Not the slow clap. <laughs> yes. For real, you be giving it to them raw. I learned so much from your page, Michelle. I really do. Thank I learned you. so much. And um, just off topic again, like, I never knew that there were so many different ways to cook. <laughs> Y'all, this girl will find some way to make some damn black food. Without, yes, with, within the constraints of this damn illness and diet that I have to function within. Yeah. Yeah, I mean. yeah you make it, you be making it happen. So yeah, let's, let's jump right in here though. We'll, we'll catch up a little bit afterwards. So I'll have some time too. Um, okay. So welcome to Black Unicorns. Um, we know that she's white. We know she's a white unicorn, but she's actually an alicorn. She's not a unicorn. We I have the wings that, yeah. and the, it's an alicorn, but so My we, daughter would definitely let you know that if she heard you say unicorn. <laughs> okay, cool, cool. I've gotten checked a few times and I'm like, I just want you to know that I know. Um, good, good. <laughs> but yeah, so, you know, I know you, but you know, the viewers, obviously some people may know you, um, may not, but. Uh, I always like to start with, um, you know, the question, like, how do you identify? And that is mm -hmm. an open-ended question, however you want to answer it, because um, there's many levels to that question. And then just on a surface level, your pronouns, you know, because, you know, everybody got to have their pronouns today. Pronouns. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, my name is Michelle Taboo, and I identify as she, her, but on a lot of days, I'm definitely they. Um but I just, she, her is fine. Um, I am a filmmaker, a graphic designer, an actor. I always say former dancer, but mm -hmm. I've stopped saying that because even though I can't dance full out anymore, like right. I can still dance. And the fact that I can still move and, and right. even the fact that my spirit can come up with choreography while right. I'm listening to music, mm -hmm. I'm still a dancer even if I'm in a wheelchair or, you know, whatever, like, I'm right, gonna... right. Um, and I am bisexual. Um, what else? I'm in a long-term partnership with a man, a cis man. Um, I have two kids. One is 11 going on 59 just kidding yeah, she's um so she's 11 she's my oh, daughter um and then I have a son a trans son Alec um he is 17 so, you know I didn't I don't know how I missed we're that pretty eclectic family. wow see Michelle that I, I knew we, all right me and you about to just talk then we just about to have just talking. <laughs> I, I got so many questions and you know you just so yes you know you have a lot of obviously a lot of gifts, a lot of talents. I don't even know which one to jump into first. You said a lot of them. Um, you know, out of, out of all of those, in terms of 
how like a small Michelle might be looking at this um, with all the way you with all the ways you identify you you see yourself and just said um, which which one would you want to like lead with talk about you know you know the overarching umbrella I guess is artist you know yeah. I can take nothing and make something from it um and that's been since I was little if you give me a ball of clay I can make a mouth out of it with gold teeth and you'd be like how did it even right it just happened um I, I'm a doll maker I'm about to be in a black um documentary about uh doll making mm. um yeah it's just art yeah yeah you know, uh, 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 even choreography when I when I set a piece on dancers they are my paint you know um stage is my canvas and then graphic design it started out while I was at Lula Washington Dance Theater and you know in a nonprofit, you you don't have a job title I mean you do but right it's how do you, how can I be of service basically? Cause we don't have all of the things that we need, all of the positions that we need. So I wore like 15 hats and I was just like, these posters could be better. I feel like I could right. get the company booked if it looked like this, this, this. So I figured out how to do it, but then I fell in love with graphic design. Mm. Um, and when I'm working with clients, I'm not an artist. When I'm working with clients, I'm working for hire. I need to do right. the best possible product that's going to get them business right mm -hmm. um but when I'm working for myself I can do whatever I want with no no input from anyone and mm -hmm. I think that's been sort of the central thesis of my life is mm -hmm. I want to do what I want to do and how can I make money doing what I want to do mm -hmm. um and how can I be the most vulnerable while I'm doing it and how can I imp impact people's lives while I'm doing it for tw for 15 or 20 years I was an activist um mm. I'm not anymore it is rigorous and I'm gonna leave it to the to the young people it's yeah. too much for my mental health yeah um so yeah that's um that was I'm, a lot Sorry. but yeah no, no, I, I appreciate you for saying it and I, you know I, I'll let this I like I let these interviews kind of do that because I think it's important one thing about you know when I when I call people black unicorns, I really believe the people that, on, that come on the show, they really are magical. They really, I'm not using the term loosely. Um, um, I see it in you. And there's, um, there's obviously a lot of other people. You have like 10,000 followers. Um, listen to your stories and stuff like that. I'm probably 15,000 15, 15, followers <laughs> on one of your platforms, on one of your platforms. Right. But um, mm -hmm. so obviously other people feel that way. Um, so what just came to me though, um, while you were talking about like your um, your gifts and 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 how you identify as an artist, as a creative, mm -hmm. um, how is it you? How do you manage all of those things? Like you know, how how does that work? Like what is a day like if you have a graphic design and you're choreographing? you know i know you're you're dealing with some health issues like how do you how do you manage all these things and i think it's important like just people hear the magic of what you're doing yeah like what's behind it i yeah. get it i get it um so from very young i was a rigorous planner and i think it's because both of my parents were air signs and they kind of weren't planners they were flighty and i'm i'm an air sign too mm -hmm. but because the house was like all four of us just do 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 you know yeah. i was like i need some structure like i need to do my homework at this time and then i'm going to take my shower at this time and da, da. and it became a thing and i didn't realize it was forming my identity so organizers planners washi tape highlighters gel pens that's me um and so now in a more digital world that translates into google calendars i have each of my family members has an email address they have a um mm. a google calendar and i sync them all and i make sure everybody is where they're supposed to be um when they're supposed to be because my daughter is an actor Right. And so that's audition, that's callbacks, that's self tapes, that's oh, you're booked, so we need to fly out. So that's me right. booking the flight. And then, we, you know what I mean? So it's right, there's right. a lot of dots, and that's just the family part. Right. Um, but with the art, like right now, I'm choreographing a musical, um, something rotten. And mm -hmm. so I have to, you know, plot out the points for the formations. I'm doing right. all of that on my iPad. 
had. I put little dots. Wow. I put everyone's name next to them, where they're going to stand. Um, you know, I'm putting entrances, exits, blocking, etc. cetera. Mm. And I don't have an assistant for it. So I have to make sure that I'm on it. I identify as far as like, you know, I identify as a black gay man, is, um, you know, uh, and uh, my pronouns are he, him. Okay, just, just what, he? He, him, his. Is that right? He, him, is, yeah. Listen, yeah. you know, there's a school of people that, you know, no, we gotta, we gotta, we gotta hit them all with that. I'm he, older, him. I'm the older, older generation, so I'm still learning. I'm still trying to catch up with everything. Mm -hmm. But I think that's you know, like, how did that, you know, you talked about like your childhood, your imagination. Like, how did that all connect? You know, does that make yeah. sense? You know, it 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 does. I mean, I guess I don't know if I'm answering the question right because I feel like I'm still, I'm still going. Mm -hmm. You know, I feel like. I'm still learning and I'm still, um, I don't think that I'm there yet, you know? And I don't, I don't what? know. What? You're no, not no, there, no. Jamal? Honestly, I, I promise you. Are you everything, serious? You still feel like that? I swear to on everything I love. Y'all, yeah, so see, I, this feeling never goes away then. No, every project I get, I'm like, can I do this? Is this something that I, you know? And so there's that voice in your head that's kind of like, you know, it's that imposter syndrome, like, do you really wow. have the skill set to be able to do this? Are you sure? You know, and so I do have that. And then I have to blank him out. And then I have to push myself in the forward. I mean, push myself forward and say, okay, look, whatever it's going to be, it's going to be. And, you know, if there's anybody more qualified, you know, then, so I have to talk myself into that. So wow. it still happens. Yeah, I, mean, I promise you, I'm not saying it. I, I it's still. I actually just find it so amazing. I find it yeah. so amazing. And that's why I love this. I love this doing this because. The point of this one, the first, the first time I thought to do this, I was, you know, I was late night prayer meditation vibes, and it was like expose people to who you know, talk, talk, and don't yeah. be selfish with who you know and share or whatever. That's amazing. And, but it was so scary, just this doing this. Yeah, I know. I and know. so like, but you're doing it, and that's the yeah. thing is that although it's very scary, and you're like, I don't know if I could do it, or, but now look, we're doing it. We're sitting here, we're having a good conversation that hopefully will inspire, even if it inspires one person. Right. You've done, a, you've done your job, you know? So I think that that's, that's incredible. But we have to, we can't let those voices that get in our head that tell us that we can't, or what if this happens, or what if, what if it does happen? We'll, we'll know what to do. We'll know what to do then. When, when I am asked, about my gender and about my sex, I, I tend to decline and I write in human. I am human and, uh, and I am spirit. I'm an indivisible duality. And so there are no pronouns for that. So I, <laughs> I mean, you, you, how old were you when you started to your doctors? I was... When I started the PhD, I was 46. How did you do it? I graduated, I graduated right before I turned 50 years old. Later, I just took two summer classes and I almost died. <laughs> I took two summer classes. It was condensed five weeks. But you made it through, didn't you? I did, but. Let us shake all negativity from the top of our heads, down through our throats, down through our stomachs, down through our knees and out through our toes. Oludumare, who was the creator. Um, we ask for your continued protection and guidance in all of our human endeavors and against human suffering. We ask for the vision to see, the spirit to feel, the wisdom to know, and the courage to act. We ask to be placed at the right place, at the divine time, doing the right things with divine people, Ashe. We will keep coming back, and if it works, 
it works and so we will work it. Uh, I want to give a special shout out to Dr. Byron uh, for having me be a part of this celebration and also I just wanted to say that um, I hope that you was inspired today and that you may um, have been inspired to pick up um, something creative um, whether it's a pen just to write in your journal or to paint something that you've been wanting to paint or just writing down an idea that's been in your mind that you've just been sitting there um, you know lay one brick at a time and eventually you'll build the wall you'll build that creative thing that you've been trying to build don't try to do it all at once um, just remember that as black people uh, creativity is in our DNA it's something we've always had it's something that can't be taken away from us it can't be defined by um, how much money you make it can't be defined by your sex sexuality your gender and it, it's yours it's your it's your god-given uh, birthright so honor it by um, using it when you can and, and even when you feel like you can't uh, try to use it you know when you can um, thank you Ronaldo for the piece you contributed um, and giving us your creativity uh, make sure you guys check him out so serious and such a beautiful artist as well and I really appreciate you guys for anything you can um, contribute. Uh, grant writers, contact me. People, uh, organizers, contact me, please. Um, I do, I am looking for people to help me out with this process. And I'm grateful for any information that um, people bring. And I'm always open to listen and talk. So everybody enjoy the rest of Kwanzaa. And um, have a good next year. Peace. Hope you all Rock on. Seven.